Welcome to worship at Zion United Church of Christ in Delaware, Ohio. I'm Reverend Fred Arzola. To our guests, a special welcome. We're so glad that you're with us today. If you are on Facebook, please do greet one another. Sarah Jackson is our online host, and we invite you to comment and to post prayer requests. It is raining this morning, so we are indoors, and it is warm in here. Um, we have that room in the back that is air conditioned. If you feel like you need a few minutes to be in a cooler space, just please go right back there and, and have a seat. Um, we also, in keeping with our policy before we went out, ask you to wear your mask until you sit down. And the phrase that we use is if you're moving, your mask, if you're moving, or if you're moving, you're masking, something like that, but you know what I'm trying to say here. Um, and then there's a reminder that we have a prayer book placed on the hospitality table for you to write any respective prayers. We will share them uh, during our joys and concerns, and we also will look at Facebook for prayer requests. There are four core values about our community of faith that we share at the gathering of our service. First, our mission is to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. Second, we believe that God is still speaking in the world and in our lives. Third, we trust that God's love will change our lives. We gather together as a community of faith to celebrate and experience this love with God and with each other. Fourth, we are an open and affirming congregation with each other. Fourth, we are an open and affirming congregation. We are a diverse and inclusive community of faith, cherishing every person and committed to welcoming every person on their spiritual journey, specifically including the LGBTQIA community. Today is the sixth Sunday of Pentecost. And during this season, we continue to explore the mission of the church, the life of the church, and the people of God. As always, we begin by lighting the Christ candle. The Christ candle reminds us that Christ is the light that centers us and guides us. Please rise in body or spirit and join me in our centering for worship. We gather this day from a week filled with needs and demands. We come to find rest and renewal of our spirits. Open your hearts in love to hear the word of God. We want to quietly rest in God's presence, free from the clamor of the world. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Please join us as we sing our opening hymn, We Sing to You, O God.
Patient Lord, we schedule our lives down to the very second. We crowd in as much activity as we can and then wonder why we are so stressed out and tired. We are afraid to miss out on anything. And when it comes time to be with others, we spend our time worrying about details rather than longing for the visit. Help us to place ourselves in your care. Slow us down just a bit so that we can see the wonders you have placed before us and truly enjoy and share the blessings you have given to us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's pause for a moment of silent prayer. Almighty God, you brought creation into being through Christ, and in Christ all things find their purpose. Open our eyes to see the world as your gift, and to use your gifts for the sake of Christ, that through the witness of our lives the gospel may be proclaimed to all people. Amen. Please join me in the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please be seated. We now invite the children from kindergarten to grade five to Sunday school. And we pray blessings on our children and on our teacher today. We are so fortunate to have Reverend Julie Quarry with us. Reverend Quarry is an ordained pastor in the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. She spent most of her career in the field of education and entered ministry with her husband, Alan, in, tw in 2009. Reverend Quarry attended Lexington Theological Seminary and was ordained in 2014. She has been privileged to serve in many churches and have, uh, who have nurtured and taught her over the years. Reverend Quarry has been an elder, Christian education director, mission and outreach coordinator, teacher, trainer, and handbell director. All of this has fed her call to serve God and led her to a call to ordination. She's loving retirement and life here in Delaware and at Zion. Please join me in welcoming Reverend Julie Corey. Do that, Julie. Don't turn it off. Okay. Good morning. It is such a great day to be here. I am so grateful to be able to share my story this morning as part of our Everyone Has a Story series. And I want to say how great I really think this idea of Pastor Beth was. But as some of you who have done this before me have noted, this has turned out to be much more difficult than I thought it would be. I am also really glad that last week, Pastor Kara and the Intertwined Youth shared with us and showed and talked about how our stories interconnect, how Bible stories connect with us, and they shared how with the Good Samaritan that every one of the characters in the Good Samaritan story um, had a story of their own 
and those stories intersected and those stories connect with us. Throughout chapter 10 of Luke's Gospel, he builds and develops the theme of hospitality as a crucial mark of faithful living. Luke uses what we call the Great Commandment, to love God with all your heart and soul and strength and mind, and to love your neighbor as ourselves. He uses this to illustrate who our neighbor is through the story of the Good Samaritan. We need to see and act in the care of someone who is other than ourselves. Now today's text is the story of Martha and Mary. It follows immediately after the Good Samaritan story. Luke continues to elaborate on his theme of hospitality, maybe in a little bit different way. So I'm asking you to hear God's word for you this morning as I read Luke 10, verses 38 to 42. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that needed to be made. And she came to him and said, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things. But few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So, imagine, if you will, once upon a time, in a time far, far away, It is Sunday morning, and dressed in our Sunday best, my sister and my two brothers and I are loaded into the family station wagon, and my dad is honking the horn impatiently for my mom to get in the car. At the Metzger's next door, the Mayo's across the street, the Carpenter's three doors down, at the Fioli's, the Cotton Steady's, the Swartz's, and the Smith's. The scene was pretty much the same. Up and down the street at 10.30, yeah, circa 1962, Wellesley Drive was on its way to church. That is the culture that I grew up in, and in many ways it does seem like a galaxy or a time far, far away. It was the middle of the baby boom. Every Sunday school class by grade, was full. There was new technology becoming available. We actually had color television. We actually had a telephone without a party line. Yep, that was new technology. We were pushing as a culture and a society into the future, and it felt like we were invincible. It is in this time and in this place that I learned how to love God and all about Jesus. In the basement of Covenant Presbyterian Church in Upper Arlington, Ohio, with the cinderbock walls painted institutional green, Sunday school to school teachers were sharing the stories of Moses in his basket floating down the Nile, Joshua marching around Jericho, blowing his horn as we built sugar cube walls. David with his slingshot, you know, they never let us make slingshots. (laughs) 
Jesus in the stable, Jesus with the children, Jesus healing and teaching, Jesus on the cross. We learned all the great stories of faith. It is within this very traditional, leave it to Beaver mid 20th century world that I was insulated, protected, cared for by a loving community of faith. And it was here when our Christian education director, Ms. Scotty Wilds, asked this really geeky, definitely not part of the in crowd, this young woman to preach the sermon for Youth Sunday. And it was here that I heard my first call to ministry. So let me quickly kind of fill out the outline. I went away to college. The summer after my freshman year, I met Alan at church camp. It was the summer of 1971. We started dating in October. We were engaged by Christmas. We got married the, final, the fi following August of 1972. We didn't mess around. <laughs> yes, and that was 50 years ago next month. We moved to Dallas, where within two months, we were leading the youth program. I finished college. Alan got laid off from Texas Instruments. We thought about Alan going off to seminary while I worked to support him, but we decided against it. We moved to Dayton. We had our family. We were transferred to Fort Collins, Colorado. In every city, we quickly found a church, quickly got involved, and quickly were involved in leadership. It's the only way we knew how to be. We were youth leaders, church school directors, deacon, elder, Stephen minister, choir member, handbell choir member, handbell director, members of worship teams. We were blessed to be nurtured and to have opportunities to learn and lead and minister in many different ways, in many different settings. Then, in 2007, just as we were kind of thinking about retirement, you know, down the road a few years, we both got laid off from our jobs. We trained for commissioned ministry. We moved to Chillicothe to serve a church together as co-pastors. I got the opportunity to go to seminary. I was ordained. We moved to Kent for me to serve a church. We retired and we moved to Delaware last spring. And here we are at Zion. And there's one more thing I want to let you know because it has been important for me. Until I stepped into the pulpit in Chillicothe as pastor, I had never been a member of a church with a female pastor in any role. And yet, Yet, as I reflected for this past week, I began to realize how much I was influenced by the women in my life. Women who in their own time and place made a difference in the lives of others. They were strong women, wise women, faithful women. There was my grandmother, Elsie Chapman, whose faith was the very core of her life. And Julia Smalley, whom I'm named after, whose very difficult life led her to always search for joy. My mother, Donna Chapman, who despite our normal and often daughter-mother disagreements, was truly my role model. I had aunts who were active. I had leaders of camp, my campfire group. I had teachers and, of course, Scotty Wilds at Covenant. 
And there are so many others that I can't even begin to name them all. Within their own orbits, appropriate to their own times, they taught, they arranged, they clothed, they nurtured, and they fed people. Literally fed people. And they taught me that to follow Jesus, you lived out the truths of Matthew 25. That when we feed, clothe, house, visit, and care for others, it is as if we are caring for Jesus himself. They taught and they modeled a love of service in Christ's name. But the call to ministry that I had heard as a teenager did not go away. I mean, let's face it, it was 1970, and there had been a lot of advancements for women, but the Presbyterian church that I was belo had belonged to had only been ordaining women for 14 years. I did not see my way forward in ministry to the pulpit. So I answered my call as I had had it modeled for me. I did all the things, but it was never or never felt quite enough. Now, I don't know exactly when it was that I realized that where I belonged, what I was called to do was different from what I was doing and what I had been taught. I just knew. It wasn't a cataclysmic experience. It was just this slow deepening and increase in volume of that voice I had been hearing. Now, in 2006, Alan, as we began to think about retirement down the road, had begun his training to be a commissioned minister. We were thinking we would do some kind of mission work. You know, remember I said that at one point in the mid-70s, we considered Alan going to seminary and I would support him through it. We were kind of there again. But on one day, like so many of our really important conversations throughout our married life have started, usually with some kind of joke or funny throwaway line. I leaned over to him in the kitchen and said, maybe I better get trained as well because I'd be a really bad pastor's wife. <laughs> what I had heard for so much of my life as a niggling, quiet voice that was getting louder and louder Learn how to do this. Get trained to do this. You're going to need it one day. It finally became a reality. I want to stop here and tell a story that's not on my iPad. My mom was so wise. I hated her for being so wise sometimes. But one of the things that she used to tell me was, there is time for you as a woman to do everything you want to do. You don't have to do it all right now. Maybe right now is the time to stay home with your kids. Maybe right now is the time to do volunteer work. Maybe right now, there is something you're supposed to be doing that will help down the road. Life is a marathon, not a sprint, Julie. And I am incredibly grateful to Alan, and I promised him I wouldn't cry when I got here on this part, for hearing what was truly on my heart and supporting it. And in 2010, when I decided and had the opportunity to go to seminary, he was right there supporting my call one more time. 
So let's go back to our text. It's hard to imagine how many Bible studies, women's circle studies, books, articles, blog posts have been written about this four verses in Luke's gospel. Four verses. And many of them have been, I will admit, on my own bookshelves or in my computer files labeled Bible studies. But just listen to a few of these titles. Made Like Martha, Good News for Women Who Get Things Done. Having a Merry Heart in a Martha World, Finding Intimacy with God Amid the Busyness of Life. Not a bad book, but not my favorite. <laughs> Mary, Martha, and Me. And this one. Having a Martha Home the Merry Way, 31 Days to a Clean House and Satisfied Soul. <laughs> I will admit that I found that title on Amazon this week. I have not, nor do I intend to read that book. <laughs> the implication of so many of these titles seems to put Martha in a negative light and Mary in a positive one. We even say the story Mary and Martha, although it's really about Martha, it has been used to divide women, to seemingly define specific roles. It has been defined to keep women from the fullness of what they are called to do. And this text has always made me slightly uncomfortable and defensive because, I mean, I come from the same place as Martha in so many ways. So I had to ask myself, why did Luke put this story where he did? I mean, he could have put this story any place in his gospel as Jesus is wandering around teaching. So why here, immediately following the Good Samaritan? Well, he's still talking about hospitality, which is what Luke 10 is all about, and about caring for others. Maybe he wants Martha to remember the last two words of the great commandment. Think about it for a minute. As ourselves. Love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and with your neighbor as yourself. Maybe he wants Martha to stop and think and love herself and value her work. There's also another way to see this as well. So I want to listen to another story about Martha because it is this second story about Martha and Mary that changed my understanding of my call and that is the Martha that I so truly admire. It comes from John chapter 11, and this is part of the story of the resurrection of Lazarus. And it's part of the story that I think kind of gets glossed over and overlooked. Martha has sent a message to Jesus to tell him that her brother is really sick unto death, it says. And they need, they need him to come. But he doesn't get there in time. In fact, we know he waited. So hear God's word again this morning from John 11, verse 20. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming down the road, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said, to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know, I know that even now God will give you what you ask. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. 
Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. I was assigned to preach this text in my very first preaching class. And I will be honest with you, it kind of rocked my world at the time. I had never really been aware of this part of the resurrection of Lazarus story. And I definitely had never heard this part preached before. I sure didn't remember it if I had. Who is this Martha stepping out of her home, removing her apron, brushing the flower off her hands, and once again confronting Jesus? Lord, if you had only been here, my brother would not have died. And then makes a magnificent, magnificent confession. I believe you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. My encounter with this text in John straightens out and kind of completes the whole picture of Martha and Mary for me. We get to meet the Martha here, the independent woman who owns her own home, that we meet in John Luke's gospel, but don't really get to grasp. Mary Stromer Hansen, in her book titled A New Perspective on Mary and Martha, paints a really clear picture of Martha and Mary. She helps us to meet these gospel characters as real, living women who care and cry and serve and follow Jesus. Martha cares for the welfare of others. She opens her home as a ministry to outsiders, while still managing to minister to those within her own family. Martha is called to serve, and she does so in her own way, and she models her faith. And Mary, Mary has her own ministry as well. It's a ministry of discipleship, of sitting at Jesus' feet, and it may have turned into a ministry of public evangelism later. This text is an encounter with women who are called to learn, to share, to teach, to serve, and to minister in Jesus' kingdom. And I am so grateful, so very grateful to have been called to be one of them. Thanks be to God. Amen. Would you pray with me, please? Gracious and holy God, you call all of us to serve in some way. You call all of us into your family to do something that needs to be done. Give us the time and the quiet space to hear that voice, to understand what it is saying to you, and give us the courage to go out and act upon it. Amen. Thank you, Julie. That was just, thank you for sharing your story, and thank you for unpacking today's text so powerfully. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Do we have any prayer requests in our prayer book in the back? And if we do, can someone bring that book to me? It's right on the hospitality table. Nothing okay. Why don't we just pause for a moment of individual quiet prayer. Lord, we love you and we thank you for all the blessings that you have given to us. Lord, we are sorry for the times we have come off the path. We are grateful for your mercy and your grace. Lord, I lift up everyone here at the sanctuary, all the people joining us online, our families, Lord, this whole congregation. We lift up Pastor Beth as she continues on her sabbatical. And we pray rejuvenation for her soul. Lord, you know our needs. You know our joys, our wounds, our sorrows, our requests. We lift them up to you. And those which we keep quietly in our hearts. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. My friends, I just want to thank you for your generosity to the church. So many of you give us your time and talents and treasures, and a gift to Zion really helps to support our neighborhood, our community, and the people who are touched by the ministries of our church. We've provided you several ways to give. You can go directly to the church website, zionucc.org, and click on the donation button on the homepage. We've created a QR code that will take you straight to the donation page. You'll find it on the bottom of the bulletin, and for those worshiping at home, it's on your screen. And if you prefer to give cash or a check donation, you may simply use the envelopes on the hospitality table and simply place them in the offering plate. Or you can mail your donation to the church office. Thank you again for your generous gifts. Once again, I'm so glad that you joined us for worship this morning, both in person and online. If you're new, I would love to meet you. There is a second QR code that will take you straight to the welcome page. You'll find it at the bottom of the bulletin and also on your screen. You will also find some contact cards on the hospitality table or in the pews in front of you, and you can leave them on the offering plate as well. And if you share this information with me, I'll make sure to contact you. Um, and if you're with us today, please join us for coffee hour downstairs. As always, we need your help with setting up and breaking down for summer worship. If you are willing to help us, please speak with Alan in the back. And please do take a prayer request for the people impacted by the justice system in the Delaware County Jail. Uh, for more information on the jail ministry, please contact Sam Getter. During the month of July, as you know, uh, we are in our second book of our summer book club, and we're continuing on the study of the text by Dorothy Day called Loaves and Fishes. And the discussion will be facilitated by Megan Maynard this Wednesday, July 20th at 7 p.m. downstairs in the lower level which is very much air conditioned, which is a good thing. Please join us for our closing hymn, Would I Have Answered When You Called.
people of Zion, may you go forth as a people called, each in your own way, and may God's love shine upon you now and always. Amen. Go in peace.